Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Emmis Pitts. This is Ukraine War News Update, third part there off the 13th of July 2024. There is a vast amount of content to get through in this geopolitics video because so much is happening. NATO summit, electoral shenanigans going on in the US, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so I will try and be as concise as possible. First, we're going to start with YouTube in Russia will be slowed down from today according to russian media that's yesterday the official reason is some technical problems on google's equipment in russia but at the end of june the state duma has admitted that youtube might be slowed down instead of blocked in russia well this comes as news that uh, youtube is going to be blocked starting in september in russia the only question says Ilya ponomarenko is why they didn't do it earlier uh, the great russian internet isolation is coming with a brave new totalitarian world they're producing their own wikipedia to rewrite history that's another thing that's just come out Ru wiki or something uh because they don't like wikipedia because you know it might actually have an accurate appraisal of what has taken place in Russian history. So this revisionist uh, approach to reality is something that Russia definitely likes. You control, you know, that Orwellian cro uh, quote about those who control the past control, those who control the present control the past and those who control the past control the future. Well, wh whichever way around it is, it's like if you, if you, misinform people as to where they've come from and therefore who they are now then it allows you to control where you send them and this is all part of an authoritarian like orwellian uh, reality whereby russia completely enforce their population to exist in an information bubble of their liking i remember watching uh indeed uh, we've got it coming later, the Netflix series, The Turning Point, uh, where they're talking about how during that period of putting, um, getting rid of one oligarch, Kolokovsky, uh, and then uh, Putin demanding that he take 50% of the uh, turnover or profits or whatever it is of all of these oligarchic uh, entities in Russia at that time as he's making his own uh, stamp on that somewhat nascent R russian capitalism or oligarchy he also took the two tv stations that had become private entities under state control through gazprom and so he's just in russia he's even more so uh, constraining those uh, information conduits into into the minds of its populace such that they are just pliable um, entities that he can more easily control and YouTube is is going to be another um, another victim there the EU Commission uh, this is I don't know where the quote is from is from Politico quote the EU Commission charged Twitter or X for failing to respect EU social media law, the platform could face a multi-million euro fine in a pioneering case under the Block's new Digital Services Act, a law to clamp down on toxic and illegal online content and algorithms. Remember, there are algorithms that disfavor Ukraine news. He is very pro-Russian. Uh, it is it is a, a platform that you have to fight really hard to get your voice heard above the torrents of bots and trolls that operate on the behest of the Kremlin and other useful idiots around the world, of which I would say Elon Musk is himself a useful idiot. Now, he's been sounding off about this, uh, but as Oliver Alexander, who is uh, a decent um, journalist or decent analyst, um, uh, no, that's, that's the other, that's Oliver, what's his name? Oliver Alexander, he's an OSINT guy that did stuff on uh, Hirsch. He took apart Hirsch's claims about Nord Stream. Anyway, whatever. He says Elon is having a temper tantrum about the press release from the European Commission. Reading it, I see nothing in it that isn't objectively true. And hundreds of people haven't that uh, have already warned Elon and X about this thousands of times. So if you want to see the text of the European Communion and... And you know, maybe if you love Elon Musk, you'll be someone that's like, oh, the EU is overstretching. Well, go and read that. This is all objectively true. Twitter has is a tool, is an information tool of nefarious actors around the world. And we are all being uh, victim to manipulation uh, every single day. Uh, do we just sit back and allow Russia to manipulate our populations? 
or do we do something about it? The EU is trying to do something about it. Uh, Elon Musk is kicking off. Uh, all the while, it's just been found out that even though he said in March, back in March, he's not do donating to either um, either campaign, he is indeed donated to Trump's campaign. So uh, he's either a liar or uh, he has just changed his tune somewhat. So Elon Musk has donated to a super political action committee, so a super PAC, working to elect Donald Trump to the White House. According to Bloomberg, he's contributed to a low-profile group called America PAC. The PAC is, n n is next required to disclose its list of donors by July the 15th. Um, so Lowell Report says he, he's donated much to uh, Trump's ca presidential campaign fund, through America Pack, the exact amount is unknown. Billionaires Ken Griffin and Paul Singer also met with Trump, but the details of their discussions are not disclosed. Now, now what we do have a pretty good idea of, I, I won't go so far as to say we know, but it's generally accepted that he's going to get, he did receive under the Trump administration from 2016 to 2020 an advisory role that he then stepped back from because he had a bit of a spat with Trump. And now he, they've kind of made it up. He is apparently going to get become a business advisor to Trump. He had that meeting with Trump where it was thought that no money changed hands, but it was understood that Twitter was going to become an ampli amplifier of Trump's messages uh, such that Elon Musk is giving Trump exactly what he needs in order to get elected. So you get the amplification of the, the Trump message and what does must get back well he gets that he gets that business advisor role but more important for him it, he's being invested by, by investigated by the sec so not only does he have issues in the eu he's got issues in the us at the moment he's being investigated by the sec that is thought to be on the cards to being sort of ripped up if trump gets in and also, and this has been widely reported on by mainstream media outlets, that deregulation of the sectors in which Musk operates is also on the cards. So there are huge both financial and legal gains for Musk to support Trump. Uh, and in supporting him, he is not only amplifying Trump's message on Twitter and creating algorithms that, that best support that message, but also it appears now he's directly funding the Trump campaign. So there's a very close connection between the two. And I know lots of you will be spitting at the screen because you scream because you both love Musk and Trump or one or the other. Uh, but, you know, come with some receipts then. Um, Shashank Joshi says in July 2023, quoted from the Washington Post, Kremlin political strategists studied the Facebook profiles of more than 1,200 people they believed were workers at two major German plants, Arubus and BASF in Ludwigshafen uh, to identify employees who could be manipulated into stirring unrest. So Germany is at the forefront at the moment of sabotage uh, activities from the from the Russian government, right? The Kremlin is not only you know trying to assassinate Armin Papaga of Rheinmetall, but has apparently identified 1,200 people, or at least studied the profiles of 1,200 people, in order to identify which workers at these two key institutions or entities could be manipulated uh, to the benefit of Russia. Now that's just two companies there. Now extrapolate that across Europe and understand how much Russia is getting involved in international politics and meddling with both elections and our national securities. It's just, yeah. And we're going to talk in a, a, a little bit about how uh, they are openly now going to town on the US election. This has been announced a number of times over the last few weeks. I haven't actually talked about it uh, or, or, or discussed these sources. The, but that's coming in in a wee while. This is my favourite picture of the last uh, ever. So this is just brilliant. Not only was she rolling her eyes and in and looking at an imaginary watch while waiting for Biden, who was late to give his scripted speech, um, but she's she was caught doing this. One presumes that is indeed our Orban. It's just the best picture ever, and Maloney should just get an award for for that. It's just every time I look at it. I want to laugh. This is brilliant. Orban is a prime tool and she is appraising him quite accurately in that look. Looks, you know, picture say a thousand words 
uh, doesn't that just? Uh, okay, we're going to go to Gabrielis Landsbergis, the Lithuanian foreign minister who is always on point. These are his thoughts on the NATO summit. Uh, NATO summit, super important. Lots coming out of that. And lots was missed about that, unfortunately, because, um, because there were... The, the bandwidth was just absolutely strangled by Biden making those two gaffes, right, in his speech. But actually, the speech he made, according to every analyst, was really strong, robust, very positive, really good foreign policy substance. The sort of substance like a serious adult would make. Um, you know, if you're going to compare the sort of speech he would make about NATO in at NATO compared to one you can imagine Trump making, I, you know, I think there'll be a huge difference. Well, Landsberg is here from a very, uh, I think he comes from such a good place in terms of his pedigree. I think his father was foreign minister, was he, uh, previously, or certainly on the Lithuanian political scene during the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and Landsbergis just knows his onions. Uh, the event was well organised and sent a strong message to the people of America about the respect the USA is attracting from its allies and partners. So this is really important to say that actually the strong position of the US with regard to a pro-NATO stance means that it is it, it, it just there are a lot of people giving the US respect in a way that it should get respect. And we're going to, again, return to this a little bit later. Politically, the expectations for deliverables from the summit were low. It was clear a couple of months ago how the declaration would look. If the goal was to have a smooth event, that was achieved. What didn't happen was any major strategic breakthrough. Putin used the summit to declare he, that his goals, methods and capabilities are unchanged by attacking a number of extremely sensitive civilian targets in Ukraine. His timing shows he has a feeling of total impunity, that nothing can or will happen in response. So just at beginning of nato summit he blew up a, a children's hospital and everyone's like oh but then the end result was yeah you still can't strike air bases in in russia so putin's just going you see thank you very much thank you very much i rule the world Ukraine, says Landsberg, is still left in a grey area of insecurity. Irreversible bridges are important, but not as important as actual protection. Sooner or later, there has to be a discussion about solid and sturdy guarantees for Ukraine if we want a secure European future. The biggest missed opportunity was a decision not to allow deeper strikes into military against military targets in Russia. Absolutely. This would have been a major win, not just for Ukraine, not just for the US, but for the whole alliance. It didn't require logistics or money, just a political decision. The most significant decision for Europe is the acknowledgement that Russia is stepping up its irregular warfare and a reminder that even irregular attacks could trigger Article 5. So that's interesting. That's the idea. And I'm sure they would have discussed this in some detail. It's like, how far do, do hybrid warfare activities go before it triggers Article 5? Is it just conventional warfare that would trigger Article 5? What else could? What kind of cyber warfare thing? And, and the threshold, I was talking about this in the pub the other day with my mate about how plausible deniability gives a real um carte blanche to russia to be able to do like cyber warfare you can take down hospitals and then say hey you can't prove it's us okay what level of proof so in legal terms you talk about beyond reasonable doubt but what is reasonable doubt on a on a like naught to 100 percent of epistemological a surety. So epistemology is, a, is this study of knowledge and truth, right? Like how epistemologically uh, robust does my belief have to be that you committed a crime for you to be guilty? Is it like 97%? Is it 87%? Is it 77%? Like beyond reasonable doubt, how far does that go? Okay, beyond reasonable doubt, how, how justified or how robust is my belief in Russia committing this uh, being behind this cyber attack on, say, hospitals, how how robust does that have to be for Article 5 to be triggered, right? That is an act of war. You have attacked our hospitals. It's not with a tank. It's with cyber warfare. It's functionally the same thing. And I'm like 89% sure it was you. Like, is that good enough for Article 5? So there would have been these kind of discussions. This creates some strategic ambiguity to replace the clar clarity of passivity. Um uh, he says, it feels like we are still in denial that this war against Ukraine is a global strategic shift requiring some hard strategic decisions in response, despite Putin trying very hard to convince us. I totally agree. This is World War Three. That's my thesis. And I'll stand by it because we are functionally in World War Three. Uh, cyber warfare, information warfare, economic warfare and financial warfare, political warfare and conventional military warfare. It's all happening. 
And the only thing we're not doing is supplying frontline troops. Everything else we're doing. This is war. Um, and Landsberger says elsewhere, Putin never escalates when we help Ukraine. He escalates when we don't help enough. He absolutely jumps on on weakness and exploits it thusly. Uh, so I agree with that. Um, Zelensky is expected to travel to the UK next week to address European leaders in Blenheim Palace, or my partner went to Blenheim Palace last weekend, who are meeting to discuss Ukraine, European security and democracy. So he's getting involved in another big uh, European meeting. Hopefully something good can come out of that. Now, uh, a couple of things here. First of all, Indian state-owned oil refineries are negotiating with Russia for the long-term import of oil, according to Reuters. According to a publication, the countries have not yet agreed on the final terms of the imports. I was just looking at this face of Putin and just thinking, you know, some people say he's got the Asiatic look uh, in, in his eyes. And, and this is the whole body double uh, question I'm going to come to because I was watching uh, Netflix's very good Turning Point episode eight. You've got this Putin. You're thinking with his eyes really quite wide. And then you're thinking, OK, well, is it because he's got his cheeks stuffed full of uh you know, fillers, and Botox and whatnot. And you look at his lips, very thin lips across there. And you look at these lips and they are not thin at all. And then you're looking at the uh, ears. Is that similar ear? Could be. Uh, but but I was looking throughout this, um, this documentary at, at the different images of Putin and thinking, goodness me, you know, is this the same Putin that we are seeing uh, elsewhere? Um, let's see if I can find uh, another one. Um, there was the one later. Uh, is that one? Yeah, he looks a bit similar there, but still, you know, more open eyes. Is it just filler and stuff? And then you look there and you think, ah, that doesn't look like the same Putin uh, that you see here in that picture. So... What is interesting, though, his gait was the same. So he walks with one arm basically straight and the other arm swinging. He seems to have done that back in nineteen uh, in the nineteen nineties and then in the early two thousand. So, but then you can learn a gait, right? Uh, just, just interesting. You know, there are all these claims about body doubles, but you genuinely look at the Putin from the early two thousands here meeting with uh, Blair, uh, and you think. It genuinely looks like a different person. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Right, some 23,500 Ukrainian men have entered Moldova illegally since the start of the Russian unprovoked invasion in February 2022. Of course, those 23,500 would make up quite a few brigades, would they not? According to data seen by Radio Free Europe. Uh, talking about crossing borders... We have uh, Finland's parliament has just approved a f uh, by a, a five to six majority the most restrictive border law in Europe. Highly controversial inside and outside the country. It gives the border guards a right to reject asylum seekers on the spot. OK, so if you're kind of maybe towards the left and thinking we shouldn't be harsh to asylum seekers, etc., etc., et cetera, et cetera and, and, and immigrants in general, then this is going to be challenging. But if you are one that thinks, and I know not everyone agrees, but the Finnish claim and indeed the Polish and Baltic claims with Belarus, but the Finnish claim is with Russia, is that the Russians are sending people to the border to cause social cohesion issues by funneling uh, migrants through into Finland. And then that that uh, plays merry havoc with social cohesion and with ideas of free movement of people, etc, etc. And then that leads on to um, political disunity and European disunity. That is a, supposedly the claim. And here is the answer, which is to completely um, overhaul their approach to th at least that border. Um, I don't know how well received that is inside Finland. Uh, and again, there's going to be this argument as to whether Russia really are doing that. Well, here's a claim that, that Russia increases weaponization of migration, uh, pouring African immigrants against the Polish border is the claim here with... Um, <laughs> okay, so and a bit of choice language there, but you can see that uh, on the border in Poland there, 
there are issues with groups of migrants. Uh, here, the idea, Jane Keeve says, pouring African immigrants against the Polish border, and that is uh, weaponized by the Russians. And again, you know, we can question whether that is true and to what degree that is happening. But there have been issues. And in fact, they say that border issues have dropped uh, between Poland and Belarus uh, since they put, the, put this big, as you would expect, big kind of no man's land border kind of security up there. Uh, yeah, the, these are issues that are are either being weaponized by Russia or their genuine issues that, that these nations are coming down hard on. A, an Australian soldier and her husband have been arrested and each charged with spying for Russia. Uh, so Australia having uh, issues with Russian infiltration that we are seeing pretty much in every country at the moment. We've had issues in the UK with that uh, a depot uh, I think it was a postal depot that was connected to Ukraine or something like that being burnt in 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 the London area. Uh, recently, we've had sort of sabotage in the UK. We've had spying right across Europe, um, and here we have Australia involved as well. Um, now there is talk. Uh, there's a really good article here in Euromind Press about whether the French left will support Ukraine. So remember, you've got the centrists who are definitely in support of Ukraine, and you've got the far right who are not in support of Ukraine and very much in the sphere of influence of Russia. And then you've got the left coalition, which goes from the social, so social Democrats and the Greens through to LFI, much further to the left group. But that coalition, and this is what the article is about, has actually signed up to support France. Uh, to support Ukraine, sorry, quote, the urgent need for peace, the fact that Putin is answering for these crimes uh, before the International Court of Justice, we unequivocally reaffirm our unwavering support for the sovereignty and freedom of the Ukrainian people, particularly with regard to the integrity of its borders. We must be able to take steps to deliver the necessary weapons of the Ukrainian resistance, the seizure of the assets of the oligarchs contributing to the Russian war effort and a potential deployment of peacekeeping forces, says a new popular front. That's their written position of that left coalition. Now, if Mélenchon from the further to the left LFI wants to come out against that, he will be going against the other coalition partners and that will break up the unity of the of that pact, right? Uh, and pact. Uh, and so therefore will be counterproductive. So it's possibly in Mélenchon's, who doesn't seem to be a huge support of Ukraine, but it's in basically his best interest to continue to support Ukraine. So lots of talk there. Um, France Unbowed has made a lot of concessions. The support of the Ukrainian resistance is written in black and white in the electoral agreement. Dylan uh, Boutif uh, Boutifle uh, told Euromaidan Press, so according to Yannick Pansé, a doctor in contemporary history and research at the Centre for Interdisciplinary Studies and Strategic Issues, uh, uh, quote, reactions to the war in Ukraine were placed in a continuum of what had been defined as a consensus on defence policy. Pinsey added that, or Pansé added that it that in the current political situation, quote, everyone expects the president to retreat and even accentuate his reserved domain in defence and foreign policy, meaning that he will continue to support Ukraine strongly. There is even talk by the French government of a, quote, stronger French commitment to Ukraine. Uh, Yannick Pansé assured this is in addition to recent announcements of increased support such as authorising strikes in Russia with French weapons and very recently supplying Mirage 2000s or at least pledging that. So we're, we'll watch this space for really what kind of government forms in, in the National Assembly and whether they will overtly support Ukraine or not. And it looks it looks good if, if the government can be formed from the centrist position or the centre to centre right and centre left. There's your your biggest element of support, but the largest coalition is the is the is the left as a whole, including the centre left and the far left. Um, and so, if it's more likely to come a government to come from that section, then there still is at least a better chance than the far right that you would get continued support for Ukraine. Um, uh, we're going to go to a thread on the Russian economy just at the moment because I think it's worth uh, getting a handle. Sanctions impact Western sanctions. This is from Geo Insider, Geopolitical and Military News, OSINT 
uh, from all over the world, open source intelligence. Um, Western sanctions intensified due to the Ukraine war have severely restricted Russia's access to global markets, technology and financial systems. This has hampered economic growth and increased isolation. Russia's economy remains heavily reliant on oil and gas exports, accounting for around 40% of federal, federal budget revenues. Global oil fluctuations, price fluctuations and efforts to decouple from Russian energy have major economic in, um, implications. Uh uh, the ruble has forced significant devaluation due to has faced sorry significant devaluation due to sanctions and declining foreign investment despite interventions by the central bank of russia maintaining currency stability is an ongoing challenge efforts to diversify the economy are critical the government is promoting agriculture technology and manufacturing but progress is slow the tech sector particularly in cybersecurity software shows promise yeah the problem problem is if you are unable to get support from most of the rest of the world in the tech sector you are in a lot of trouble it's going to be so difficult to just probably rely only on um elements of asia china particularly um but yeah uh, inflation remains a critical issue exacerbated by supply chain disruptions and reduced imports the rising cost of living and stagnating wages are pressing concerns for ordinary russians the ukraine wars further strain the economy diverting resources to military spending and reconstruction the long-term economic impact includes loss of trade partners and increased budget deficits russia is pivoting towards asia strengthening economic ties with china india and other non-western countries these alliances aim to mitigate western sanctions and open new markets recent policies focus on self-sufficiency tax reforms and boosting small and medium enterprises smes however bureaucratic hurdles and corruption uh, continue to impede progress with europe seeking alternatives to russian energy russia is looking to diversify its customer base however building infrastructure and establishing new trade routes takes time and investment agriculture is a bright spot with increased production and export potential government support and investment in technology are driving growth making russia a key player on global food markets sanctions have spurred domestic innovation particularly in it and cybersecurity. Uh, Russian tech firms are gaining ground, but the sector still faces challenges due to limited access to Western technology, as mentioned. Russia's demographic issues, including an aging population and emigration of skilled workers, pose long-term economic challenges. Attracting and retaining talent is crucial for sustainable growth. And that's true in the IT sector, where they've lost a lot of their expertise over the course of the war the future holds significant challenges prolonged economic hardship is likely but collapse is not inevitable successful diversification reforms and stronger non-western alliances could help russia adapt and stabilize china has become a critical economic partner for russia providing an alternative market for energy exports and supplying technology and investment partnership helps russia mitigate some impacts of western sanctions but not all sanctions have had any intended effect some sectors have found ways to adapt or circumvent restrictions highlighting the limitations and complexities of international sanctions although the flip side is that even if they do get things through uh, the border to like dual purpose goods or components they will come at a much higher price in order to get around the sanctions you have to do you know sending it from this person to that person to that person to that person to this country to someone there to someone there and then across the border in Kyrgyzstan everyone's taking a cut things are more expensive um and finally the Russian economy stands at a crossroads navigating post-war challenges uh, sanctions and in internal reforms will determine its trajectory but stay in touch on the coming months to continue to talk about this topic says this source so as a generalize no kind of data there but that's your general lay of the land with uh, russian economy at the moment now some nato summit thoughts to go back to nato because we i've got this this here because we're going to go on to a u.s section which starts with nato some nato summit thoughts says max bergman who is a director of europe russia eurasia at csis um, he says, overall, it was a dramaless summit, at least on substance. Admin did a good job setting Ukrainian expectations, limiting acrimony and focusing on NATO's historic role. But the summit also missed an opportunity to set a new course. Let's start with the deliverables first. The Ukraine aid, air defense, etc. and the security agreements and compact are significant. NATO coordinating Ukraine aid less so. Is the US doing a bad job? Uh, but may insulate coordination in the event of Trump. So this is the idea that NATO are taking on more of a role in supporting uh, Ukraine through um, the logistics and the admin and the brokering, I guess, of aid to Ukraine rather than the US. Uh, so we'll we'll see how that pans out. Because and that is to mitigate a Trump um, 
administration. And I know some of you are like, why do you keep going on about Trump? If the whole world is talking about them, if NATO have met and one of the main things was apparently to mitigate a Trump against the Trump um, administration uh, in November or January next year, then you know, it is incumbent upon me to talk about that. A uh, second actual purpose of this summit is highly technocratic, checking in regional plan implementation, not the sexiest deliverable because it's classified. Apparently that's going well, yay, though not quite sure how since no one has any ammo anymore. Uh, third, defence production was an important focus, especially NATO refocusing on its role in standard setting, lots of various co-production initiatives and focus on ramping up production. I'm dubious about the notion of a TA defence industrial base and co-production seems a like a one-way street. A better course would be for Europeans to actually form a European industrial base, i.e. to integrate, consolidate, and then look for in, uh, targeted areas for TA cooperation, but fine. Um, oh, I've just remembered on a video I'm going to show you in a second, they talked exactly about this. You know the argument I keep saying that, that the more that the US retreat, the less that that other nations will be buying into the American industrial, military industrial base. Well, they discuss this on this video that I'm going to play you, and, and that's an element there. Um, if we take a step back this summer, I think missed an opportunity with a, a, pro, a president that cares deeply about the alliance to chart a new course for the choppy waters ahead. It was not a transformational summer, but one that cemented a status quo that may not be sustainable. 25 years ago, the 50th NATO summit in DC, the US used that summit to kneecap EU defence integration. Interesting. That was a huge foreign policy error. Uh, what the US missed and continues to miss is that NATO's profound historical significance is not that it created a military alliance, but that the alliance Alliance enabled European integration. NATO protected Europe from external threats, kept Soviets out while the European project, beginning with coal and steel, dealt with internal threats, preventing the war within Europe. The two efforts are closely linked. And this goes back to the idea that, uh, you know, people like Colby Elbridge and, and these others who are advising Trump and Trump himself says, oh, Europe are free riding on the back of the US. But the US is investment in Europe was to the strategic and economic benefits of the US, right? And so setting up bases in Europe uh, was not some kind of charity for Europe that Europe free rides on. It's American direct influence in Europe. Just, yeah. Um, and all, all those things that came out of that, that that kind of been listed there. Uh, but 25 years ago, US policy, wrongly nervous about NATO's future, strongly opposed EU defence integration efforts, San Malo declaration, to create a 60,000 strong EU force. Thus, since the 90s, NATO became an obstacle to European integration. This has significantly slowed the European project. Defence is crucial to the overall European integration effort because it requires money, i.e. fiscal capacity, and a stronger common foreign policy, which means harmonising NATO in uh, national interests. It also requires legitimacy, which means more democratic input. I've talked about this before. There's, there's been this whole idea against a, a European armed forces, in, in, certainly from British Brexit voters and Leave voters, that was one of the arguments. And I'm like, I don't understand. If you've got NATO and you've got UN, like EU makes sense. If the EU is going to be more than just an economic um, arrangement, there is some kind of political integration, then, and you have ideas about foreign policy, which is the EU supporting Ukraine being a prime example, then to not have security as part of that is bizarre. Like it's hugely important security in terms of your political uh, intentions, but also like it, security expenditure requires an economic integration. You know, if you're going to, these are all connected, right? You can't have all of these ideas without security involved. And so it's interesting that the idea here is that actually the NATO position in the last 25 years has stopped further EU integration, partly because of um, a lack of military, military industrial strategizing on a Europe-wide front. Um, but yeah, uh, it means a more democratic input. If the EU had moved forward on integrating defense over the last 25 years with the US and NATO backing, the EU would be in a far stronger place. Also, Europe would likely be in a far better place militarily. Uh, today, European militaries remain a fragmented, loosely coordinated mess of 27 to 30 states, all with bespoke militaries. 
um, and this goes back to like uh, Europe are free riding. Europe are possibly not in a position, or they need to stand up more. Trump needs to understand history here, which is they would be standing up more if American influence on NATO 25 years ago had taken a different course. So part of the reason why you've got this fragmented, weakened European uh, military scenario is, well, the main reason is the US and how it has uh, demanded things be. Um, yeah, thus, uh, so Europe's defence industrial base is barely European. Thus, Europe's security depends on the US calling the shots and acting with, that, with European militaries as appendages to the US war fighting efforts. During the Cold War, that was out of necessity. But after the Cold War, we didn't evolve our role because we didn't want to keep the status quo because we like calling the shots. But Trump, generational change and China all challenge our reliability, continued interest in Europe and capacity, he says from an American point of view. So the we is the US. We also need and want the EU to be a stronger global actor that can speak with one voice, see China and Taiwan, all of which would be furthered by defence integration. Thus, this summit was a missed opportunity to once again align NATO with the larger European project to actually outline what a European pillar within NATO would look like to chart an EU defence role and begin with what would be a generational effort to integrate European military. This is also what Europeans want. EU defence integration is not a political third rail. No one cares about the uh, MODs. European publics overwhelmingly support defence integration, more than 80%. EPP, so that's one of the coalition um, groups in the European Parliament, just ran and won on this. For most Europeans, the threat is to Europe, not the nation. Uh, so to Europe rather than to the country. To be fair, Biden administration has dramatically changed US policy toward the EU from Bush Obama Trump. Summit language on EU is also more positive, less guarded than in the past. But the summit could have accelerated and focused the effort to build a European pillar and it didn't. Um, so uh, you can go and check out the, his musings on that in CI CSIS uh, literature. Uh, so interesting appraisal there so then we go on to the u.s section here uh we got the key of independence saying european allies are ready to cut china investment over russian backing biden says so part of what came out of nato uh, and part of the intention from biden was to put china on the map in terms of security threats and vulnerabilities for nato uh the european nato countries are ready to curb their investments it in china over the country's support for russia's full-scale invasion of ukraine u.s joe biden president joe biden said in washington on the 11th now china then hit back and said hey we're we're not we're not we we take umbrage at you guys saying that we are backing russia and blah 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 and and put us being in in the crosshairs of nato so there could be a growing tension between those two entities um, Anton Kereschenko says Joe Biden said that he has no good reason to talk to Vladimir Putin at the moment unless Putin quote changes his behavior Putin, and this comes from this is a uh, voice of America have got this snippet from uh, Biden speaking and Biden says Putin's got a problem they've not been very successful they've caused horrible damage and loss of life but they've also lost over 350,000 troops and military killed or wounded they have over a million people particularly young people with technical capability leaving Russia because they see no future there they've got a problem uh, so it turns out that that beyond the gaffes uh, Joe Biden was fairly strong on what he said with regard to uh, his speech at, at NATO. I'm just going to go to a, a great, I, I listen to as many of these as I possibly can. The rest is politics US. I listen to the rest is politics, the UK version. They started a US version with Anthony Scaramucci and Katie Kay here, and it's, it's pretty insightful. This has been critical to peace and security in the world for the last 75 years, as you point out. And yet there's this huge shadow hanging over NATO and its future just at the moment that's been revivified, just as it's been expanded. And that shadow is Donald Trump, who has given very conflicted messages about what he plans to do with NATO, on the one hand saying that he would like to pull out of NATO, on the other saying that he wouldn't support Article 5 of NATO, his national security team telling reporters behind the scenes, don't worry, he's actually going to stay committed to it, he's just going to try and get them to spend more money. But there is enough concern amongst NATO members that what in one, I had a conversation with an ambassador from a NATO country in Washington, DC, and I asked him, okay, so name me one good thing about Donald Trump getting reelected. And he laughed awkwardly. 
And then there was silence. He said, I can't. There's no, there is no one good thing from our point of view about Donald Trump getting reelected. So you've got these NATO. And I know you just think I'm always slagging off Donald Trump because it's my want, political want. But the genuine, like these are people who are talking to ambassadors in NATO summits who are saying, this is a massive worry. So it's incumbent upon me to communicate that to you. Leaders coming here, celebrating, but also wondering, wow, shit. Are we actually at the kind of pre-funeral stage of this organization? Because we don't honestly know if Donald Trump gets reelected, what his intentions are for this okay, organization. Okay, so work, 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 workshop that for me. Uh, Donald Trump is reelected. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think happens to NATO? Uh, what do you think happens to the alliance? What do you think happens to the uh, loan that Joe Biden has offered the Ukrainian government uh, a few weeks ago? So I think, I mean, one of the things that was interesting last year that went kind of unnoticed was a move in the Senate, um, spearheaded by Marco Rubio, actually, who might be Donald Trump's vice presidential pick, who knows, next we will have that probably in that announcement, um, to try and shore up support for NATO, to make it very difficult for any American president to pull out of NATO. So Marco Rubio was kind of signaling, look, I'm trying to protect NATO ahead of a possible Donald Trump presidency. But you can pull, you could, it's one thing to pull out, it's another to basically wind down the finances. You could just have a reduction in commitments that would effectively make neuter NATO and make it ineffective. I think that's quite a strong possibility. I'm, I'm not sure I buy the national security team. If argument that actually they would stand by NATO. Donald Trump doesn't like multilateral organizations. He thinks that NATO has been screwing America. Um, he's not particularly impressed by some of the countries now upping their defense spending to 2%. He'd like to take it to 3% or even potentially 4%. That's just very unlikely to happen. So I think you, you see a serious degrading of all multilateral organizations, including NATO. I mean, one one Amer European diplomat said to me, it's increasingly clear that America first means Europe last. It's not actually that, that Donald Trump has antipathy to many countries in the world, but he really does seem to have an antipathy towards Europe and feels that Europe's been freeloading. I think for the Ukrainians who we've had Zelensky in town this week, you know, trying to appease American lawmakers like Mike Johnson by being super conciliatory and thanking them so much for everything they've done. The Ukrainians are watching the American election closer almost than Americans are watching it because they know for them this is existential. I think that's a fascinating insight there. We're just going to join uh, the pair of them a little bit later to uh, cast their opinion further. Um, just getting to the right spot. Here it Brent. is. And so we're not putting pressure on these nations. So I want you to I want you to respond to where we are right now. Does 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 NATO then say we're going to have to go alone without the United States? Let's go to three percent, or 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 does NATO make it without the United States? So so the requirement is not actually a requirement; it's a target. And it was at, it was Barack Obama who first started pushing NATO countries to meet that target, but it was really Donald Trump who kind of strong-armed them into doing so. That and the invasion of Crimea in 2014 kind of woke NATO up, but you have to give Donald Trump credit. And actually European diplomats in Washington are pretty clear about that, that Donald Trump should be thanked for pushing European countries to increase their defense spending. Um, well, yes and no. He, ha he was strong on that in 2018, I think it was. And there was a little bit of movement with upping of spending. But it was war in Ukraine in 2022 that really moved the needle on that one. And she does touch on a, an important point, which is, and there is a very good interview that we're just going to dip into in a second of Alexander Stubb, who is the one of the Nordic uh, premiers who was interviewed on Fox, who bigged up Trump for pushing uh, NATO members to up their spending. And I think there's this move to, because uh, Trump is really good on flattery. Uh, like he, You flatter him, he loves it. And you know people like King Jong-un and Putin and Xi Jinping, they know this. Flatter him, you get more out of him. And if you say, well, it was, it was Trump who that got everything moving on, ramping up defense spending, then even if that's not really wholly true, maybe somewhat true to, to a smaller degree, but you play on that and that is your way of getting around 
uh, getting around Trump and getting Trump to to appreciate NATO more because he sees himself as responsible for it being at the position it is in. I don't think that anyone thinks that without the United States, um, it, NATO is a viable defense organization. Now, maybe the silver lining, if there is one for a Europe's point of view of a Donald Trump presidency, would that it actually be that it forces European countries to take their own defense more seriously and coordinate more closely and have some kind of unified defense policy and up their defense budgets. Now that you've got you know, a country like Poland, which is spending 4% of its GDP on uh, defense spending, that's pretty similar to what the United States is spending. Uh, the UK is at 2.3%. Uh, Keir Starmer, the new prime minister, is committed to go to 2.5%. So countries are increasing, but there's no way that they could replace America's massive defense juggernaut and that security umbrella if Amer- if Donald Trump were serious. I mean, look, you know, Russia is spending something like 6% of its GDP on defense. So I don't think that there's any way anyone thinks that without the United States, Europe survive that nato survives as an organization as we know it you th- think it could do anthony you think it- uh, he goes on uh, and they they too i think it's in in that conversation where they talk about like the more that you force the europe to stand up on its own two feet the less it will rely on the american defense and the less influential american uh, policy making is and politics is and also the less uh, money and influence the military industrial sector has in the US. So again, you know, there are other people recognizing those things I was talking about recently, uh, good stuff there. So, um, and this is Alexander Stubb here with Pekka Kaliniemi says uh, that um, the Finnish president here, uh, this is how you do interviews as a politician with a, with a partisan media. So it's on Fox News who don't like Biden are trying to get Alexander Stubb to say Biden was too old and making gas and was rubbish. And he didn't comment on domestic policies, raises concerns about the division and polarisation with societies and gives credit where credit is due. And and that's what Alexander Stubb did really, really well. He was just of American pol- completely baited. Uh, I'm, uh, this video has gone on too long, so I won't actually play it. But it's a really good interview, this, where Alexander Stubb is absolutely on point with the way he answered that. And again, massaging the Fox News uh anchor th- through kind of fo- uh through trump or massaging trump and therefore getting the fox news presenter on side by saying yeah trump was responsible for upping spending in in nato and but this polarization is not helpful and blah 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 and he just answers it so well really good stuff right victor orban's wrote after meeting with trump that good news he's going to solve it so again these like blanket really vague statements that trump is going to solve uh, the Ukraine war, just like that. Uh, Trump has said previously that he has a plan for ending the Russian war in Ukraine quickly, but he never gave any details. I talked about that again yesterday in my sort of moral um, romp through the uh, philosophical meadows in my extra video yesterday. But we have to remember what Orban and, and Trump believe. This is Remember, this is Orban speaking uh, previously. So uh, this is obviously in... Uh, in Hungarian, so I'll read the subtitles. Donald Trump has a very clear vision that is hard to disagree with. He says the following. Of course, he says this, but he doesn't say how he's going to do it. First, he will not give a single penny for the Russia-Ukrainian war. Sorry, this is the how he's going to do it. This is the one where he does say how he's going to he's going to get peace, which is by stopping supporting Ukraine totally. So he says the following. First, he will not give a single penny for the Russia-Ukrainian war. That's why the war will end. If the Americans don't give money and weapons along with the Europeans, the war will end. And if the Americans don't give money, then the Europeans won't be able to fund this war alone. And then the war will end. Donald Trump may not be president of the US yet, but his party is stopping Democrats from spending money on the war. So this is during that seven-month uh, impasse. Trump says when he comes back, he won't give a penny to Ukraine. That's when the war will be over. And he says he doesn't want to fund Europe's security instead of the Europeans, and the Europeans are afraid of the Russians. 
So he, the idea that the US is funding the European security, you know, against the will of the US and it's the U Europeans just skimping rather than this like 70 years of strategic involvement in US security. And 25 years ago, NATO saying, no, we don't want you to have this this strong integrated security framework. Or we want to be the ones calling the shots here. So we're going to stop that from happening. Uh, and of course, it, the, the reality is not convenient for, for Trump, who wants to just become more and more isolationist and, and, he, and he offers to stop the war within 24 hours but gives no real uh, mechanism doing that other than stopping supplying Ukraine with anything and so the war just grinds to a halt because Ukraine get destroyed by the U, by the Russians. As a result of Orban getting involved in doing this kind of stuff, six U, EU companies have skipped ministerial meetings in protest of Hungary's Russian outreach. Diplomatic protests unfolds within the EU as six member states will boycott ministerial level meetings during Hungary's presidential term in response to Orban's meeting with Putin. So all is not well within uh, the EU there. But the Russian government is... Well, we knew this was happening anyway, but Wall Street Journal here is a pro... Uh, is a Murdoch pro-Trumpian paper, says the Russian government has launched a whole-of-government effort to influence the outcome of the US presidential election and favours Republican candidate Donald Trump in the race, senior US intelligence officials say. Uh, and this is patently obvious because the propagandists tell you every day on state TV in Russia that Trump's their man, literally our man is 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 how that how they call him. And you've got Lots of people very openly discussing how they would want Trump to be president. And if you are a Trump supporter or a Republican supporter, you've got to then wonder if that's your right man, if he's the one that the dictator wants over there. And he's the one that Orban wants. And he's a dictator wannabe in the EU. That no, none of, We talk about how much we despise Viktor Orban and his, his political shenanigans and the growing autocracy in this country. Like, you don't have a problem with that, but as soon but but as soon as he goes through the US and speaks to Trump, like many people just switch to like, oh, that's fine, that's great, that's all right. And and Trump saying that he's the greatest leader in Europe is somehow all right. This is a problem. There are so many double standards. I'm consistent. I am fully consistent. I don't have a problem with my views. Uh, I don't have to do these jumping around mental gerrymandering uh, to to allow for such things. Uh, Trump's anti-China rhetoric is all performative, says Phillips O'Brien. He will always choose China over Taiwan. He makes more money in China. And this is why it's so fraudulent of his backers to say Ukraine needs to be abandoned to confront China. Trump has no intention of confronting China. Adam uh, Kinzinger here says, former Republican lawmaker, uh, wait, who is on China's payroll? Oh, all of them. I literally sat in the Oval Office as Trump asked me and a few others to do President Xi a favour and take China's ZT, ZTE off the sanction list. Bolton wrote about that too. So John Bolton, National Security Advisor. Trump loves China. Just, yeah. Taiwan is ticked off over the RNC snub. For the first time since 1980, Taiwan didn't rate a mention in the Republican National Committee's party platform released this week. Compare that to the platform in 2016, the GOP didn't produce one in 2020, that described the island as a loyal friend and pledged to help Taiwan defend itself. The RNC's exclusion of Taiwan in the platform came despite extensive out intensive outreach by Taiwan's diplomatic outpost in Washington, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, to persuade GOP allies to get Taiwan on, into the platform. Two people familiar with uh, that effort told China Watcher. China Watcher granted the uh, to anonymity because they were not allowed to discuss US-Taiwan issues on record. Like, what I, I don't like Trump as a human being, but I certainly don't like his, his political uh, intentions and... Um, you know, the direction of travel that he would take the US in is incredibly worrying. Um, so then we have the announcement of Trump's running partner, the vice president. Some, A lot of people are now saying it's going to be J.D. Vance. I've for a long time said it's going to be J.D. Vance, most probably. It, it's either him, Doug Bergen, highly unlikely, or Marco Rubio. Now, Marco Rubio would be the better strategic choice for Trump because you've got MAGA and then you've got sensible republicanism and... Um, Marco Rubio is a conduit towards sensible republicanism. 
He ran for president himself, and he's a lot more kind of moderate than, say, J.D. Vance has, has morphed to be a younger replica of Donald Trump. And so if you get someone like J.D. Vance as his running mate, then you're just keeping within this very narrow set of like ideology. Uh, Marco Rubio would be a much better at strategic decision, but I think he'll go for Vance out of kind of narcissism, probably. Some actor defended, uh, Gary Kasparov says, when I called Vance a corrupt pro-Kremlin shill, uh, but here he is auditioning to be Trump's vice president and Putin's vice poodle by repeating long-refuted anti-Ukraine Kremlin propaganda. Uh, so this is Jay Nordlinger saying, on Steve Bannon's show, J.D. Vance said, quote, there are people who would cut social security, throw our grandparents into poverty. Why? So that one of Zelensky's ministers can buy a bigger yacht. This is gross demagoguery and Kremlin propaganda. In other words, a natural for the ticket. The Conservative Republicans I know, I knew way back would have been repulsed by this, by the demagoguery and the Kremlin propaganda. Funny how parties shift in certain periods. You could get whiplash. Uh, yeah, just it seems that it's okay to repeat actual Kremlin propaganda. Um, and, and run for vice president and become vice president. And if he becomes vice president and Trump is president, you can kiss goodbye to support for Ukraine. I don't care what some of you say. The only option would be if he saw himself as a massive world hero by helping Ukraine. But I think if you look at all the people surrounding him and all the Russian propaganda that they are ensconced in, his son, uh, his, his team, whether it be, uh, you know, Vought, Steve Miller, J.D. Vance, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, uh, um, El Elbridge, Colby Elbridge, all these people, they are just pro-Russian. Phillips O'Brien says, if Trump picks Vance as his VP, it's further proof that he will abandon Ukraine if he wins the presidency again. Vance has been extremely vocal in his desire to cut Ukraine off and has voted against aid to Ukraine this year. Uh, and then here we have Republicans against Trump saying J.D. Vance is one of the most rabidly anti-Ukraine U.S. senators and he regularly spews Russian propaganda. And the news item here is Republican senator says Ukraine should cede land and cut a deal with Putin to end the war. That's what J.D. Vance thinks. And if he becomes vice president, there you go. Um, and then all the while we've got the gaffes. All right, this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek. Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump moments after signing an agreement on the partition of Ukraine. Of course, there's Zelensky and um, and Kamala Harris here, who Biden accidentally called uh, those different names. So what's going on with Biden? Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about, well, we, we, this is from Jake Tapper saying, a long-term Biden advisor said this, I just think there is an unfortunate inevitability to all of this. I'm sad because I've known him a long time and he's a good man. I'm angry at his inner circle who have not served him well and at times committed malpractice in their service and I'm frustrated at the family for not expanding the circle so there would be a truth teller or two in their midst. They created a perfect storm of an echo chamber and it's biting them all in the ass. Now, there is still this thing rumbling on as whether he's going to pull out or not. There are apparently listening to a bunch of analysts who said we have spoken to so many democratic lawmakers like loads of them senators and representatives not one of them has has told us that they support biden uh, continuing to run but n hardly any of them are saying it in public but behind the scenes everyone is agreed it's not cool now i know if he refuses to go then you've got to get back behind biden if you want the democrats to win obviously um but I was thinking about this. Why are the people around him keeping it in? And there's two things that are really important. One, is, so one thing is apparently his family are really behind him. If Hunter Biden uh, has another court case coming up, uh, thinks that his father being in position will allow like either a pardon or something like that, then he is going to be fighting hard for his father to remain in the race. So that's interesting. And then you've got actually just the simple fact that his whole team if Biden doesn't run, will be sacked. And Kamala Harris is unlikely to employ any of those to, in her own team or whoever else it's going to be. And so these people will lose a job. So actually, it's in the self-interest of these people to misinform, to disinform their, their boss to keep them in the race. They will want to keep Biden in the race so that they keep their jobs. And I wonder if that's an important thing to consider as well, because my opinion is that I think Kamala Harris is actually a, a better option. I've been seeing more and more of her and she's just so on point. And part of why people don't have faith in her is they haven't seen her enough. And she then suddenly gets out there and puts on a good, good performance. Then 
you will see the already better polls for her become increasingly decent. It's interesting, though, that the polls for Biden are holding at the moment, which is uh, interesting. Anyway, that's enough for me. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, share. Take care. Speak soon. Toodle pips.